I guess we are live. Let me get, get all this squared away. Like that. Okay. You said you started it right? Okay, cool. Well, I guess as everyone is getting settled in, uh, we can start our Sunday school lesson. We are in Romans 7, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. And, um, yeah, if you've got the handout, we are uh, going to be talking about what it means to be released from the law and um, what else we see here in this passage. It was very beneficial for me, and even this morning as I was coming to work, it kind of, or coming to work, coming to church, it kind of uh, messed me up a little bit. And so that was good. It was the final little lesson I needed to learn before teaching this, but uh, before we get started, let us pray, and um, then we will start our time of, of study. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we are thankful for you and for this day that you have created. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in it, for you are God and we are your people, and it is in you we have fullness of joy, we have comfort, peace, all the things that uh, we need for this life and godliness, and so uh, you have carried along these men to write your word, and uh, through this we are able to learn of who you are and uh, the goodness that comes from you. So Lord, we ask in this time, as uh, Jesus prayed, that you uh, sanctify us in truth, that your word is truth, uh, that uh, every man be a liar but you be true, and as we do this, that we are sanctified, we are uh, washed in your word, we are uh, brought into further conformance into the image of your son and that through all these things we are able to worship you better uh, and it will continue to prepare our hearts for our time of worship this morning and uh, that we can just glory in the fact that uh, you are our God and you are perfect, holy, altogether lovely. You are all these things that uh, the way you describe yourself through your word. So through this time we just pray and ask for uh, you to guide us and we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Romans uh, 7, verses 1 through 6. Uh, since this is our passage, we're going to go ahead and read these verses and uh, get into our time. So it says this, Or do you not know, brothers, for I, am, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person as only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by the law uh, to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, uh, belong to, another to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. That is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. So... I wanted to open with uh, well, the reading and then also a question to kind of get our, um, our thoughts, you know, our, our thoughts, our juices flowing. And so when you look back at your life and how you lived before Christ, right, before Christ came and saved you, like are there things that, that you think about that just make you like shake your head or just be like, man, that was very dumb of me to do. Is, am I the only one? No, I've got some. Got some others? Okay. So, <laughs> so there's, okay, so I'm not the only one, right? So there's, and if we think about that, right, that there's these regrets that we have, usually what we can also uh, go to is that there's, even today, there's triggers in our lives that cause us to think about those things as well, right? They, they bring up to mind the things that we've done in our past, and, you know, they cause us to condemn ourselves or just to really uh, harp on them and, and kind of focus on the consequences of those things. Now, I hope in our lesson today that as we think on those things moving forward, if you haven't already done this, that we take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. That, that's the goal 
ultimately that I, that I hope to get across for us today. So as we read and study this passage, I think we can uh, apply what we learned today to help us in this way. So my intent with our time is to try to recap, and I think this is something we pretty much do weekly, where we've been in order to see where we're going. Uh, it, I think it's really important for us because with the letter, of, the letter to the Roman church, uh, you know, we're just taking little snippets, right? We're taking verses at a time, but this, this letter was not written, written in a chapter verse form, right? It was written as a letter on a scroll. And so it wasn't until the 14 or 1500s that this was kind of changed into this chapter and verse format. And so for the first 1400 years of the church, they just had these parchments, right? It was just a full on letter, just like if someone wrote you a letter today or an email, it just kind of comes in paragraph forms, right? Uh, so, so our intention, right, is to try to um, read this as if we were reading it during the first century, right? When the church originally got the letter, how would they have received these words? That's, that's the intention, to, to try to take that insight, that interpretation, and then apply it to us uh, today. And so to do that, I feel like we need to go back to the beginning, right? We have to go back to chapter 1, not in Genesis, but in, in Romans, right? We go back to Romans 1 and see the intent of this letter and then kind of high level go through the chapters and then end up where we are in chapter 7 because chapter 7 it, it's pretty much just an expansion of chapter 6, and then chapter 6 is an expansion of chapter 5, and 5, 4, 4, 3. And so it's kind of good for us to kind of see where we started and then kind of just high-level look at it and then fall back down in, in chapter 7 where we are today. So this is how Romans opens up. This is the first six verses. Uh, it says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, if you can't tell, Paul is, uh, I guess I'd take after Paul. He's very long-winded, right? That's like, and that's not even the end of the sentence, right? It's the, he has these very, very long thought out. I mean, he's, he is not leaving any stone unturned when he writes this stuff. But for the sake of time, we're stopping there, right? So what are the two big things that we see here? Well, he opens this letter by telling us that he, Paul, has been set apart for the gospel. Now, if you have the handout, that's one of our first little fill-in-the-blanks there, right? He is, Paul is telling us that he has been set apart for the gospel of God. And he's set apart for the gospel of God in order to bring about obedience of faith, the obedience of faith, for the sake of Christ, right? That's, that's the intent of his letter. That's what he's telling us right here in the first couple of verses. So if we don't learn anything else today, that's, that's primary, right? This is the intent of Paul's letter. Um, by verse 16... Uh, we read in, in this chapter that the gospel is the power of God to, for salvation for all who believe, right? He tells us he's, he's set apart for the gospel to bring about obedience of faith, and we see that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Uh, so what we see here in verses chapter, or excuse me, in ch chapters one through three, he proceeds to build this case that the, uh, it's the sinful, or the, he's building a case or an argument for the sinfulness of mankind, all mankind. Right, Jew and Gentile, They're, all of us are fallen, all of us are broken, all of us are unrighteous, no one is good, no one seeks after God, uh, no one understands, and no one has the fear before God. That's in, in Romans chapter 3. Uh, so if that's what he's telling us in these first three chapters, this means that if all of us are equally wicked or unrighteous, right, if none of us are good and all of us are seeking after our own good, we are equally guilty before God. That's Jew and Gentile. This is, this is where we stand before God naturally from birth, right? The second, we, uh, the second we're conceived, right? Like David says, he was conceived in iniquity. It wasn't the fact that his parents were committing adultery or some kind of act of sin was committed. It was just we're, we have a sin nature, right, from Adam. It comes from Adam. Adam and Eve were both sinners. They had babies. They created baby sinners, right, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, right, it doesn't end there. The gospel tells us that by grace, we find forgiveness through faith in the atoning sacrificial life, death, 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's, that's what we see in chapters 1 through 3. Well, then we get to chapter 4, and then we start gaining a deeper understanding of what justification by faith uh, alone is, and it's, oh, uh, wow. We understand a deeper understanding of justification by faith and its implications, right? So if we're saved by grace through faith, well, what does that mean for us? Well, in chapters 4 through 6, this topic gets expanded a little further. And then that takes us into chapter 7, where we find ourselves today. And so the purpose of us kind of recapping this is to try to help us wrap our minds around where we find ourselves today. And the intent of this letter, as we already said, was to bring about obedience, the obedience of faith for the sake of Christ. Right? That's the whole intent of Paul writing this letter. It's to teach us who we are and how we are to live. Right, teaches who we are as Christians, as those who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone and how we are to live. So knowing this pure gospel, knowing how we are saved and what we are saved from, these are all crucial aspects of the Christian life. So do we have any questions so far? That's us kind of trying to recap and, and find us where we are today. Did I go too fast, too slow, too much info, too little info? What do y'all think is there? Repeat the whole thing all over? Okay, let's start back. Is there any, I mean, did that trigger any thoughts for y'all as far as what what we talked about? Does that sound familiar as far as the studies we've gone through so far? In, in, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Paul, yeah, people like to pit Paul against Jesus in their teachings, and well, these contradict, so if Jesus, Jesus is obviously God, so Paul's going to have to, you know, his words don't mean as much, right? And it's like, no, Paul was sent by Christ, and so he's speaking on behalf of Christ. Same authority, yeah, all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted to me, and then he tells him to go out and make, a, uh, make disciples of all nations, right? He's given them this authority by the power of the Holy Spirit, has nothing to do with Paul, right? It's all to do with the the grace of God in his life. So yeah, so yeah, it's important for us to understand that uh, the distinction in the authors, right? Because even what we know about Jesus has been told to us by the apostles. So it's not like we have Jesus like writing these words, right? He inspired them, right? He breathed them out through the apostles. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, but he's not actually penning these words, right? These words are penned through the personalities of the apostles uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, they, they, they're cohesive, right? They're not, they're not contradictory. So we are going to start in verses 1 through 3, and this is, um, you know, it's, it's Father's Day, right? But we, there's this passage talking about divorce and adultery and all this, right? It's kind of in there, but... Let's, I'm going to reread these verses, and then we're going to talk about the context that we have here. So it says this, verses 1 through 3. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies... She is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So, right, we've already talked, we've we've carried where we are from chapters 1 to 6, really, really high level, right, kind of coming down. Then then this pops up, right? So how does this fit into this? Is this passage, is Paul trying to talk about divorce and remarriage solely 
in this? Like, is his sole intent to talk about divorce and marriage here in these verses? What would y'all say? No? Any yeses? You can disagree. We'll, we'll talk about it. About the law? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, that's good. Like, is the focal point of these verses, like, should we gain our theology of, of marriage and divorce and remarriage and all that from these verses? Well, there's something in here for us to learn, but is that the, is that the intent of what Paul's getting across, right? No. Um, it, our, our, our theology for divorce, remarriage, and marriage, and adultery, all this, has, this is part of the, this is part of the pie, right? This is a one piece in the puzzle. Uh, but it's not solely talking about this. Paul is using the marriage covenant and how that works as an illustration for the law, right? As you had mentioned. We go back to chapter six, right? There's a couple of times it's mentioned that we've been saved by this grace and we're free from this sin and we're sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. And then Paul says, well, we're, we're, should, should we go and sin more so that grace may abound? Well, by no means, right? This is kind of what he's talking about in chapter six, right? He's, he's telling us like grace has saved us from, from everything that we, all the sin we've committed, it's freed us from the law, all this is going on. And so the natural thought for us as, man, as, as mankind is, well, then I guess if the law doesn't apply, I can do whatever I want. So that's what he's addressing. And then he's given us an illustration of why this is not the case. And so... Yeah, based on what we see in, in Paul's argument uh, that he's already put forth, this you know he's making these implications of, um, or what we, we see another implication of our of being. Hold on, I wrote that wrong. Of our our of our death to sin, uh, we see implications of our justification, um, of our justification being our death to sin and our freedom in Christ. That's what we're seeing here, right? Another illustration of that. So. That's where this illustration finds its basis. Just like a wife is freed from her marital obligations, right, the law of marriage as it's described here, by death, right, we, we say in, in, in our vows, so death do us part, uh, so are obligations to the law, being a slave to sin, uh, and by nature, children of wrath is what the scriptures say, that's also been removed, right? When we died with Christ, that obligation has also been removed. So to, just to kind of throw this out there so no one's not thinking we're kind of sweeping this under, under the rug. Is divorce and remarriage a difficult and, and controversial topic? Absolutely, right? But Paul is trying to help the Romans understand uh, marriage and the ramification, or is, is he trying to under, help us understand marriage and the ramifications of divorce? No, that's not the intent. It's just one example that they would be able to relate to. So before he can discuss marriage between man and wife, right, before this topic comes up, uh, he's got to help us understand our marriage as the church, as the bride of Christ to the bridegroom, right? That, that relationship, that foundational truth has to be established before we can put any building on top of that, right? The foundation has to be set. And so if we, we must be grounded in the faith, deeply rooted in the scriptures of what they teach us about God and what he's done for us before we can see how we are to live. So like I said, the whole intention of this letter is to teach us who we are, in order that we can know how we are to live. Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing is that we have to realize, like, sometimes we think, um, like, I need to I need to do these things to to have a better relationship with the Lord. Right. Like that's that's I need to do these things to I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to stop cussing. I need to stop watching whatever. And blah, blah. I need to do all these things in order to to have a better relationship with, with the Lord. And it's like, no, obedience flows directly out of a deeper understanding of who God is. Like we must know him in order to know how we must follow him. And so uh, Philippians 1, 9 through 11 is a good example of this. Uh, Paul's prayer isn't like, I mean, not that he doesn't say flee from sexual immorality or free, flee from sin or none of those things. Those, all the commands that Paul gives are after he lays out the gospel in his letters. It's never, it's never uh, law and then, uh, and then gospel. It's always gospel and then law or commandments, right? This is, all, this is the way he lays out his letters. So, for example, here in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, right, we see the heart of Paul in his letter to the Philippians when he says this, 
And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Why does he ask this? So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ Jesus, uh, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. All right, so he's not saying, hey, do these things and you'll be a better Christian. He's like, learn more about who God is, right? Discern, right? Is this of God or is this not of God, right? You have to know more about him, just like we have with uh, people who are counterfeit experts, right? As they're trying to decipher fake dollar bills or $100 bills or whatever, they know the dollar bill or they know the, the U.S. currency better than they know anything else or maybe. And so whenever these counterfeits come, they're able to spot the faults in it, right? They study what's true in order to understand what's false, right? You don't go trying to study the false things and un to understand what's true. It's, it's what's true first. And so we go to God's word. We learn more about who he is in order for us to gain a better understanding of that. And then we're able to go forward, just like in our relationships with each other, right? If you've been married for 20, 30 years, you know your spouse fairly well, or at least you should. And if someone comes to you with an accusation that just sounds completely off the wall from anything they'd ever do, you're going to be like, what? But if you've only been dating for a couple of days, weeks, months, and they come with that same accusation, you may think that there's some truth to it because you don't know them as well as you would if you had been with them for 20, 30 years. And so that's, that's where we need to find ourselves is knowing God better. Like we must allow him to sanctify us with his truth. His word is truth. And so that's where we are, right, with those verses. Um, so do we have any thoughts or questions so far? Any, any other Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just like when you see quotes in, in clickbait articles, this person said this. You're like, what? Why would they say that? And then it's like, oh, well, of course, they, I would have said that. You know, um, it, it's you're taking something out of context and making it your own. And so, yeah, it's really important to understand context. Context, context is key. Um, or if I guess uh, old James, Dave Ramsey would probably say context is king. Like he talks about cash is king. All right, so let's look at verses four through six. <clears throat> so after he's kind of laid out this, this illustration of what he was talking about in chapter six, this is where we get the, um, like he's driving home the point. So it says this, likewise, brothers, right? This is referring to the illustration he just laid out, which was an expansion of what was seen in chapter six. Likewise, brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive so that we may, or so that we serve in a new way of the spirit and not in the old ways of the written code. So what do y'all think it means when he says you also have died to the law through the body of Christ? What do y'all think that means?
Yeah, so, yeah, he's, he's that obligation has been removed uh, legally, right? It's ha it has a legal ramification, a righteous uh, separation. It's not like a, a sinful separation, right? It's not, um, you know, like think about someone who commits a crime. This is the way I heard it described this week. Um, like if somebody murders someone and then they get murdered, well, they, you can't charge a dead man for his crimes, right? It's, it's, it's taken care of in one sense. But like there's no, you know, that, that's no longer binding to that person. They've, they've, they've since passed. And so just like a, a marriage is dissolved by death, legally, righteously, uh, tragically, right? But it's, it's, it's a legal set. There's no sin in, in a person dying and then them being free to remarry, right? Since there is no sin there, well, there is no sin from our obligation to the law uh, being separated because of our death with Christ, right? So that's kind of what we see here. You're going to say something, bro. Yeah, yeah, we have to. Yeah, it's it's easy to to like we don't we don't speak this way, right? A lot of times, like people may say you're dead to me, right? They may say something like that, but we don't typically use this kind of language. Colossians two thirteen and fourteen says this: "And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands." This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, right? So this, he canceled this record of debt with all its legal demands, right? So he didn't do this unrighteously. He didn't break the law for love, right? As we hear Stephen Furtick say, uh, he nailed them to the cross. So they were paid for, right? That, that's, that's, what, that's what Christ, or that's what, yeah, that's what Christ has done for us. These sins were, were paid for, so they died with him. They died with Christ. Uh, therefore, these, if these sins were taken from us, we died with them as well. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? He, he took that sin for us. Right? That way there was no, he didn't just forgive sins. Right? That, that would be an unjust thing to do because he is a holy God. He is a just God. Uh, we wouldn't want somebody who committed a sin against us to go before a judge and say, you know what, I'm just going to forgive you this time. That, that's not just, right? Someone has to pay for sins. And so Jesus paid for those sins for us. He took that, he took that, that penalty for us. That way he would be righteous, holy, just in his actions. And then he can also offer grace and forgiveness because of that, right? So it's, we have to understand, I think a lot of times, you know, we don't want to think in legal terms and in these like formal processes because our relationship with God is like loving and it's, it's in our heart and it's in our mind, you know, and he just makes us feel this certain way. But it's like God is very precise in everything that he's done, right? When, he, when Jesus came to, to live his life, he fulfilled the law. Like everything that the law demanded, he did. So he, he didn't just live a life just kind of walking by and loving people. Like, I mean, he loved people, but that wasn't the only thing he did. He, he was very mindful of the law, right? He was very intellectual, uh, but he was also very caring and compassionate. He, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't divorce love from compassion, right, and, and law and, and obedience. All those things are comprised in him. And so he's able to do that, and, and I think that's important for us to understand, for us to have a better understanding of our relationship with God and then also how we can be forgiven, right? We don't just forgive people because they wronged us. It's because we've been forgiven, right? Christ is either going to pay for that sin. on the, He either paid for it on the cross or that person, if they do not bow their knee to God, will pay for it in eternity. So it's going to be one or the other. We've got no right to hold that against anyone, right? It's, it's either in Christ or it's in Adam, right? They're going to, it's going to be one or the other. Uh, we are not the, the judge, right, the ultimate judge. So uh, what this tells us, right, we've already kind of said this. This has been said a, a couple of times. We are no longer under any obligation to the law. Uh, not that following commands and obedience are not required anymore. Uh, that's that's the, the blank that we have on our handout. Uh, but our salvation is not dependent on our performance to the law, right? So we're not required to, 
to fulfill the law anymore. That's not a, a righteous requirement for us in order to achieve salvation. Now we obey out of reverence for Christ, right? It, there's a, there's a, a, a shift in why we do it. Uh, we are not trying to perform or to keep up with the law. It is, it is all about grace at this point. So um, with that, right, that's my little segue. I want us to kind of talk about two things uh, with the remainder of our time. We're going to try to end by 1030 to keep that little window uh, for fellowship between services. Um, but what, the two big takeaways that I want us to focus on in this, I kind of already mentioned it, but th these are the applications of the uh, understanding of us not being, not condemning ourselves anymore. I think these two things help us understand that. Um, I want to talk about what it means for us to not be under the law, but under grace, and what it means for us to not be under the law, but under grace. And I want to talk about these two things. You're like, they're the same thing. What? Yeah, I want us to talk about both of those. What it means to be under the law, not under grace, and what it means for us to be under the law and not under grace. So, um, what does it mean? What does it mean, right? When when we hear this phrase, when we see it in Scripture, what does it mean for us to not be under law but under grace? Because am I the only one that's heard this phrase tossed around like uh, randomly, or has anybody else ever heard anybody use that phrase? Any guess? Yes. No. No. Okay. So. Yeah, so what, what people do is if you're like, hey, you can't, you know, you, you, you know you're, you're gossiping about this, this brother in Christ, you know, like you shouldn't be doing that. I'm, I'm not under law, I'm under grace, like God will forgive me, right? That's kind of like a, a cushion that people put underneath themselves in order to not feel so bad about their sin, right? Because you'll hear in churches, you know, we don't need to talk about sin. People already know they're sinners, right? We just need to show them like these mistakes that they've made. God can forgive them, right? There's this real softball approach and a uh, kitty glove approach that's put on um, at times to try to get people uh, to not offend people, right? But the gospel is offensive. We can't get around it. We don't have to make it offensive. It's already offensive. Uh, so we need, to, we need to just be speaking truth in love, right? That's what we need to do. Uh, but this is a phrase that gets tossed around, right? Now, I'm not under law, but I'm under grace. And uh, it's, it, Paul said it, and I'm, I can't remember where. I should have looked it up. It's, it's in Romans. Uh, where he says it, but we have to understand the context, right? We can't just take this phrase out and make it a cliche and, and live by that motto. So what does it mean for us to be not under law, but under grace? Well, I think we've already kind of talked about it, but we are no longer under the Mosaic covenant, right? That we're not, we're not under that, the covenant of works, right? We're not under that covenant. That, that's, that doesn't apply to us anymore. We don't have ceremonial cleansing rights. We don't have food restrictions, clothing restrictions, right? We can have, we can wear mixed fabrics. Uh, we don't have to perform temple sacrifices. We don't have to give a tithe to the temple and, and these uh, different, you know, grain offerings and different things like that. There's no ceremonial uncleanliness. Uh, these aren't things that we have to do. We don't have to check boxes in order to show that we are the holy nation of God, right? There's not this physical uh, appearance that we have to maintain in order to be set apart as this holy nation for God. Now, we say that, and it's like, okay, well, that's old covenant ways, quote unquote, but what I'm not saying is that there was a different way to be saved back then, right? There was just different laws in place, right? It has always been salvation by grace alone through faith alone. That's always the way Paul told us this in chapter four, right? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, right? So that, that's where we get, Paul's making this argument that it's not, based on the law that we are saved. Uh, it's, and it's always been this way, right? We see this uh, in Hebrews, right? In the, in the faith chapter, by faith, this person did this, this person did that, right? It's, it's all about faith, our faith in Christ and what he has done for us. So salvation has always been the same way, but there were obligations under the Mosaic law that, re that God required of his people in order for them to receive physical blessings in the promised land, right? They were told they had, they had to obey all these things in order to, to be prosperous, right? This was how God set up his covenant in, 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 uh, the, for the nation of Israel, right? We can't get around that. That's just the way he, he operated uh, for that covenant. That was purely his right, his prerogative to do so. But we are no longer under that, that covenant, right? We are in the new covenant, right? The covenant of grace, that's where we are. So that is the, that is the meaning of not being under law, but being under grace, right? That's the first side of it. 
right? We are no longer obligated to the law as we've been discussing in this passage. Now, you may say, okay, well, the Ten Commandments, right? Is that, is that binding on us today? And we would say, yes, right? Uh, the law of God was written on our hearts. We just read this, well, last time I taught, we referenced it. And it's in Romans 2.15 is where it says it. Um, but yeah, the, the law is written on our hearts. So that's, that's, that's the parameters in which we live, right? That tells us these things are, this is how we love God, right? The first, the first tablet, which is the first four commandments. And then the, the last six are, is the second tablet or table of the law. That's how we love people, right? We love God and love people by following his commands. And so, yeah, the laws, the laws, the law, the Ten Commandments is still binding because that's, that transcends time. That, that reflects God's character, right? That's, that's why that is still applicable to us, but it doesn't mean that it saves us, right? We don't fulfill the Ten Commandments and, and we're saved. Um, so that's, that's that, right? Uh, let me see. Yeah, so the law of God, right, this is the, the purpose of the law, even for us today, is as we see in Galatians 3, 23 and 24, that it served as a tutor or a guide is the way that it's described in those verses uh, to point us to Christ, right? Anytime we read the Ten Commandments, we should never say, got it, got it, nailed it, nailed it, right? That's not the way we should read the Ten Commandments. When we read the Ten Commandments, it should be like, yeah, I, no, no, no. No, you know, that, that should be the way we read it because it reflects God's character. We are not God and we fail him miserably all the time. And so as we see that, it should point us like, man, I am not this. I, I cannot do this. I need help, right? It, that, that's what the, the law of God should do for us. It should point us to him. It should serve as a guide to him. And so, so that's that, right? So that's what it means to me to be not under law, but under grace, right? We are not in that old covenant. The new covenant been, been, has been ushered in. And as we saw in Romans 1, the righteous shall live by faith. That's Romans 1, 17. That's how we are to live our life, is, is by faith in Christ and all that he has commanded. And so that's, that's that, right? That's what it means for us to be under uh, law, but uh, not under law, but under grace. So the other question I want to ask is, what does it mean for us to not be under law, but under grace, right? If we see what it means, now we need to see what it means for us. Well, I want to read some verses, and I think I put them down and they're in, in, the, um, in the handout. But this, these verses is what we'll see in our next chapter, uh, is what it means for us to not be under law, but under grace. So I'm just going to rattle off these verses as we go here. Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What else does it mean for us to be under grace? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's verse 26. Verse 28. And we know that those who love God, all things, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, verse 31, the second half of that verse, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? That's, that's the grace that we're under, these verses that we're reading. Verse 33 who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. All right, this is another thing that shows us that we're under grace. And then the chapter ends with these verses. Know in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Christ Jesus our Lord, right? That's what it means for us to be under grace, all these things that we see here. It means all that and more, really, I and mean, it's not just that, but that's just a, a snippet of what we see in that chapter. And so as we get to chapter seven in a couple, probably in a month or so, or chapter eight, um, yeah, we're going to have a good time in there because it's, we're starting to see this outpouring of God's grace um, in, in, the, in the life of the believer. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, now, yeah, so now going back to verse one, like when I think about there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, that we are not under law, right? We're not under the obligation of the law, but we are under grace. 
Um, as I thought more on that and through this week, I've been, it's been kind of, this is the thing that I've been learning, right? This is the thing that I hope to, to kind of impart, is that the word? Yeah, impart to you guys uh, through this time. Like, <clears throat> there's been some, you know, I've, I've been meditating on it, chewing on it, and thinking about what that verse means, that, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? That we have been released from the law, right? We are married to Christ, like all these things. Like, what is... What is something in my life where I don't recognize God's grace uh, for what it is and that like the, the law that 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 bound me, that was weak uh, to save me, um, that that I'm still clinging to? Like, what is it in my life where I'm still kind of doing that? And I think what what ends up happening a lot of times, like as I'm going through this reformation, right, my theology is going through a reformation, um, there's a lot of things that I used to believe that I was taught that I'm like wanting to run away from it so 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 badly, like I'm overcorrecting to the other side, right? There's I'm, I was like hitting the warning tracks, going into this ditch, and so then I turn, you know, overcorrect, end up in this other side, and so there's things that that were were taught poorly uh, that were still had semblances of truth in them that. I just did away with them completely because I didn't want anything to do with that that former way of life, and so that's kind of where 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 I'm finding myself right 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 now. It's like this little fine tuning of of theology, right? So something that comes up for me is, uh, and I think we, I've said it, I've heard multiple people here say it, uh, where we kind of we we have this this thought where we're like, you know, I don't I deserve nothing good because it's only God that is good. And, uh, you know, it, it's so whatever I whatever I get in this life, hey, this is just what I this is what I deserve. Right. Like heartache, pain, tragedies. If, if I'm sick, hey, this because of sin, this is what I this is what I deserve. Right. I, and, you know, I, I got no one to blame but myself for for what I'm going through. And, and I have this like th that that kind of thought going through my head. Um, is that something that anyone else? I mean, am I it's OK? So is there anyone else that kind of does that to themselves or am I or, or are we alone? Yeah. Yeah. Right. We kind of think, OK, well, you know, yeah, we're sinners. We live in a sin, the sinful world. It's cursed. So curses are going to come and go. And it's just kind of like, hey, this is where we are. This is what we deserve. You know, if, if Adam hadn't sinned, we hadn't sinned in Adam, as Romans five tells us, then, you know, things would have been a lot better because this is where we are. This is our lot in life. Right. And there's this uh, complacency with where we are. So is, is that I've seen a couple of yeses. Yes. Always can. Yeah. Any anybody else before we? I just want to see if I'm, you know, if, if we're, if if I if my assessment of us is true because I I've, I've heard stuff like this, right? So okay, so where am I going, right? We're we're running low on time. So the the the, the challenge that I've given myself, and I want to read this so I don't um, say it incorrectly. I don't go off too far, but <clears throat> right, I would say something like, well, by nature I'm a child of wrath, born in Adam. And I'm headed for hell, right? That naturally, that's where I'm, I'm going, right? That's that's just where we are at birth, right? We're sinful people, and this is where we're going. Uh, and and because we're under law, right? We're obligated to the law, right? As we talked about, death separates us from that because Christ, um, Christ sacrificed for us. But the consequences of sin, all that stuff, is tied to this this life. Uh, but now I am no longer my own. I was bought with a price. Christ is my head. He has imputed or counted me as righteous. He has declared me righteous by grace through faith. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Not only that, uh, God will make all things work together for our good. All things, uh, all things for good, right? This is what he's done. Like, I have this natural perspective, this, you know, where I'm headed for hell. God saved me from that, and now there's no condemnation. He's going to work all things for good. You know, who can bring a charge against God's elect? All these things that we said, it's great and it's wonderful. Um, but what does that what does that mean? How does that play out in in daily life? Well, what I shouldn't do, if I shouldn't look at my problems, my heartache, my pain, the tragedies, the things that I go through, even the foolish stuff that I do now that has natural consequences. Right? If I smack one of my kids or whatever, and then they hate me for for a period of time, or I, you know, someone, you know adultery, whatever, whatever the heinous sin is, commit murder, whatever it is, right? I, I can't look at those things and say, okay, well, this is God punishing me for the sins I've committed, right? I, I can't do that. I can't say God is punishing me in this time for these sins I've committed. 
Now you're saying, well, well, hold on, like he disciplines those he loves? Like, yeah, absolutely. But, right, is it punishment? Punishment extracts, you know, it extracts from you, right? When you're trying to take something from someone that, that, um, that they've done, right? They've taken something from you, you're extracting that justice from them. But if Christ paid for this on the cross, the, the debt is paid, right? Sins past, present, and future. All sins have been paid for. And so how, should, how then should I view these things that I do? Even when I do foolish things, like when I sin today, the sins I've committed today, how should I view them, right, in light of what Christ has done for me? How do I take these thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ, as I mentioned at the beginning of the study? Okay, well, my foolishness now, punishment has been paid for, right? There's going to be consequences. There's going to be things that happen. But how should I view these things? God is using these things to bring about his glory and my good, right? That's, that's how I need to look at them. It's, it's no longer like, oh, well, I, I murdered this person. Now I got to go to jail. That, that's the punishment I've received. No, God is using this for your good. The sin, the, the, the consequences or the punishment was paid for on the cross, right? And, and that's, that's the, the, the hard part for us because we don't want to go back to this antinomian, like there's this law, licentiousness, I've, I've got the right to sin, and it's like, no, it's changing the perspective and the way we look at it. Why? I mean, not why. Changing the way we look at it, right? It's not about what's done is done and what's going to happen is going to happen. But what is the purpose of that? Is God punishing me in order for me to turn back and grovel to him and do this and that? No, he tells us in 1 John that um, if we confess our sins before him, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, right? That, that's, it's, it's already been paid for. So, it, it's, it's, like I said, to, to overcorrect, this is where I ended up where I was just like, no, nah, yeah, I deserve this, right? Yeah, you know, I'm a sinner. I've done these things, and, and this, this is where I am. I, this, this is what I deserve. But then it's like, no, how do I view that rightly? Because all, the punishment has already been paid. I, I, can't, I can't punish myself any more than Jesus already did on the cross. Like, I, there's nothing I can do in this life that was worse than that. I, I can never... Uh, punish myself enough to, to atone for my own sins. They've already been paid for. And so we can end up like Luther, Martin Luther, and just like flagellate ourselves and, you know, make ourselves sick to our stomachs and starve ourselves and, uh, you know, do all these things in order to try to make ourselves feel better about the sins we've committed where we can trust in Christ and what he's done for us in order for us to live a life that pleases him. Does that make sense? Am I the only one that's kind of thinking that way? That's, that's the thing that's been like really on my heart, because even on my way up here, I was, I was telling somebody, like, I hit every light. There was a train, so I had to turn around to avoid it, and it was, like, every light I hit, like, every light. It was just enough to, like, slow me down and then go and slow down and then go, you know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, it was just, you know, and here I am, like, stressing it out and, <clears throat> you know, not trusting that God, you know, man, who knows? What, what if I... What if I, you know, I kept going and somebody hit me or whatever, anything could have happened, man. And anything could have happened. If I went the other way, who knows? But it's like, these are trials that we go through, right? And we're supposed to count them all joy uh, because this is, yes, sir, go ahead.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you think about a, like someone getting sued for whatever and there's like punitive damages that you pay for. It's like, well, you did this and you owe this to me now, right? And, and But discipline is this directing, correcting, uh, pointing out flaws in order to, to, to rightly uh, act. I mean, it's, it's completely different aspects. Like, you know, we, we use the term punishment uh, loosely, I think. Like, oh, I punished my kids. You know, I took away their games or whatever. And it's like, well, if I'm taking it away in order to extract something out of them, then there, there's then I'm I'm condemning them essentially. But if I'm taking it away in order for them to see their errors, like, hey, look, this this game is like consuming you. Let's pull it away for a while and focus on other things so you can see that better. That, that's that's discipline, right? I've disciplined them instead of uh, extracting justice and 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 punishing them and receiving something back from them. And so, yeah, go ahead, David. Right. Yeah, conviction and condemnation are, yeah, and it's a, it's a thin line. You know, that's the thing with between justice and punish or uh, discipline and punishment. There's a thin line there. Like, yeah, if, if you know, if our, if our eye causes us to stumble, we should pluck it out. There should be a, 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 a fleeing from sin, absolutely. But is it like, I owe this to God. Look, look what I did. I took my own eye out. Or it's like, no, I, I, I can't see clearly with his eye. I can't see you for who you are, so I'm, I need to take it out. Like, cause I, I want to see you better, right? Like, what's the motivation behind it? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, so, like, um, yeah, that's the thing that we, we lose sight of, like, and th this is what Paul is getting across. This is why he's laying out these examples, because logically, this is where our mind goes. Um, well, if, you, if that means, like, all my sin is covered and where I sin, grace abounds even more, well, what's to stop someone from just open, openly sinning? It's like, well, no. Like, do you understand what you've been saved from? Like, do you understand that, you know, everything that he talked about in chapters 1 through 3, and, and this is where... This is where sinfulness leads us, right? Storing up this wrath and denying our God, our uh, God and Master, Lord, and and worshiping these creatures rather than the Creator, and you know suppressing the truth. All these things that He talks about, like this is this is where we are. So do you understand, right? The things that He saved you from. Don't don't go back to that like a dog goes to his vomit, right? Flee from that. You're a new creation. You have new desires. You you have a new Master and Lord. You're no longer slave to these sins, as we talked about in chapter six. Now I have a new master. I want to serve him. I want to love him. I'm, I'm married to him now, right? As, as the body, we're married to Christ. So there's, there's a new obligation to us. That's the, the love that he's commanded of us, right? That's that new commandment that he gave us to, to love each other as he has loved us. Uh, and by that, all, all people will know our love for him is by the way we love each other. And so, yeah. So I, I think it's, uh, that, that's, like I said, this may be, y'all may have already learned this, right? I, I, this may be new for me, but um, it was just, slightly tweaking the way that I think about things because 
yeah, like I, I know my sin. Y'all know your sin. And so you think of, you know, your mind goes back to, hey, well, had I not done all these things, this wouldn't have happened. And it's like, well, it's not happening because of things you've done. God knows you past, present, and future. He's using these things to bring about your good, to conform you to the image of Christ in order that you can be more like him and serve him better. And, and these trials that we go through, we count them joy because they're purging um, the, 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 uh, the leaven from us, right? The, the sinful desires are purging these, these things out of us in order for us to flee those things. Like if God revealed all our sin to us the, the day we were saved, our heads would explode, right? There's so much sin that corrupts us, like, and we don't even recognize it. But it's like, think about where you were five years ago when you were a believer, how you acted then, 10 years ago, if you were a believer that long, how you were acting then, like there's progression, right? You look back at those things and you're like, why was I doing that? Like, even as a Christian, why was I doing these things? Well, God sees you for who you are and he is patient with us, right? In our sinfulness. And so it's like, yeah, if you knew, if you only knew what he knew, you would have used these same things too, to, to bring about your sanctification, right? That's, that's what he's doing it for. It's not punishment. Just like with our kids, it shouldn't be punishment, right? I am doing this for your good, right? This hurts me more than it hurts you, right? Spanking them, it's, it, it, it kind of like pastors as it recalibrates, right? It knocks out some of those cobwebs and then you're able to, okay, yeah, now, yeah, this is where this leads me, right? I don't want to do that anymore. I, wanna, I don't want to do that. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the big takeaway, like I said, that I, I was hoping for us to understand is that there's, not, there's no condemnation for us, right? That those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation uh, so when those thoughts come about that, well, because of this, this is why I'm having this or because of this. Yeah, even if it's, you know, even if you run a red light and you get pulled over, yeah, you're going to get a ticket. But why? It's God is using that to remind you, you are not who you think you are. You are not God. You know, you're still falling. You're still broken. You still need me. Oh, yeah, you're right. And this is this isn't punishment. Right. This is just another reminder for you. This is discipline for you to, to turn back and recognize your need for me. Now, um, yeah, I kind of went over our time, but I feel like it was necessary for this. So uh, do we have any other thoughts before we finish our time? Okay, well, let's pray so we can finish, uh, close out our time. Dear Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given us this morning. Thank you so much for your son and the gift of life that we have in him. May we be people who recognize the uh, joy that is found in you, uh, the, the punishment that we've been freed from, and the, the sanctificated, sanctifying work that you are doing in us through your spirit. Uh, your word tells us that you will never leave us nor forsake us so we can rejoice and just know that you are good and uh, you are working your good out uh, within us. Uh, we pray for our time as we go into worship here in a little bit that we are able to do so in spirit and in truth, that uh, our pastor and the music team are able to lead us in worship well. And we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.